that the Middle East today is a better place than it was at the 7th of October. Because at the 7th of October, uh, the proxies of Iran, both uh, Hezbollah and Hamas, and later on the Houthis that joined to this circle of fire, um, they were um, certain that Israel is something that's very easy to defeat just by using all the ammunition they had, all the support they received from Iran to brutally and barbarically kill innocent Jews and to horrify the country. And a year after, I can tell you the resilience of the Israeli people is, is incredible. People are willing to fight in all fronts to make sure terror organizations won't exist and won't threat on our, on our people. And this is why I believe it's a better Middle East than it was a year ago. But the Middle East is on the brink of a regional war, isn't it? I mean, I don't think whatever side you're on, whatever your views are, I think it's hard to deny that, that it could be just a few days, a few weeks from a, a brutal regional war, which could then expand into, people are saying, a world war. Now, living under the threat of that, I'm not sure how you can describe the Middle East as a better place than a year ago. Because we, we managed to hurt those terror organizations that were basically the way of Iran to operate in the region. Because what Iran wanted to do basically is to work through the proxies and to threaten Israel. And you know that Hezbollah is, is seriously damaged by, with its leadership uh, being eliminated. Um, we managed to take off 60% of the rocket arsenal and the missiles ar arsenal. And as you know, Hamas now is not functionally operating and running the Gaza Strip. And this is what we wanted. There is virtually not, not an area of Gaza that hasn't been obliterated. And that's why people think that Israel has gone over the top. 41,000 people. I mean, we can debate the figures, but that's the figure that seems to be accepted. 41,000 people have been killed. Now, there's all this talk about proportionality, but that's why people are so angry. So um, if I'm going back uh, maybe to the things I said, maybe it's a good opportunity actually to put things in the right framework because... In, in any point, I didn't mean that Israel was targeting civilians because this is not what we were doing. Actually, we were doing the opposite. Um, Israel was operating in Gaza in a way that every single uh, area of Gaza that was under uh, our troops fighting Hamas terrorists, we made sure that Palestinians will be in a different area, finding de designated places together with the UN organizations that will supply them shelter, food, and the humanitarian But even needs. those areas Wait were a bombed second. at Wait a second. No, let, let me just conclude that because if you go Going to the numbers, so first of all, as you said, uh, most of the numbers coming from Hamas and they cannot be trusted. But even if you go to this uh, this number, uh, no one uh, has a doubt that most of the people that were killed were involved with terrorism. We killed 20,000 terrorists according to the Israeli data. And we believe that some of the people that got killed were involved with terrorism. And, and unfortunately, a war is not a pleasant thing. So we didn't choose this war. At the 6th of October, there was a complete ceasefire, as you remember. Israeli, Israelis lived their life peacefully. We wanted just to go to the synagogue to celebrate a Jewish holiday, and this barbaric attack happened. Do, do you accept any of the criticism about the pager attack being dangerous to civilians? Because there were civilian injuries and deaths. The pagers were mostly owned by Hezbollah terrorists, so you can say it's targeted from that point of view. Um, but there was a lot of criticism over that attack. Do you understand why? As you know, Israel never took responsibility on the pager attack. We do take responsibility on killing Hassan Nasrallah. I think it was a very important moment of fighting but it terrorism. It couldn't have been anyone else. I don't understand why this reluctance to accept responsibility for it, because it's who, very, who it's else would simple. it have been? Uh, well, you can guess. But, uh, but, <laughs> no, but, I can't. That's the, pro that's the point. So be creative. But I think, I think in the end of the day, I can only as a diplomat refer to official actions of my country. Is a two-state solution desirable? I think peace is desirable. I think we all That's want to... That's not the answer to the question. I answer. want to be very direct with the question. People are uh, trapped into formula that uh, Israel tried for 25 years, for generations. The result of that was unfortunately more radicalism on the Palestinian side. So we cannot just go back doing the same thing. I think it was Einstein that said that. If you repeat on the same action again and again and you think that a new, solu a new result will come out of it, uh, you're a total idiot. So uh, we don't want to be in a situation where we don't address the issues. We need to build trust between our two people. We need to build true peace between our people. We need to 
make a lot of focus on educating the, the young generation, just like the Gulf countries. They change all the curriculum in their textbooks. They're teaching anti-Semitism. They're teaching about the Holocaust. They're making sure that Jews are not dehumanized. I think uh, the way to go towards peace, and Israel loves peace, Um, uh, the path of peace and this is why we made peace with our neighbors with Egypt with Jordan and we signed the Abraham Accords the way to move forward is with having the right infrastructure if the Palestinian state will be Gaza then the answer is you're expecting Israel to have the Third Reich next to a Jewish state we don't want the Third Reich ideology as well, long as I didn't, I didn't as mention long, Gaza you've, you've thrown but in Gaza, something there but that's Gaza a, was um, a place that they got to have free ruling of the Palestinian leadership. The result was genocidal ideology against the Jewish people. No one wants to have that. We don't want a second Gaza. We need to build better infrastructure for future peace. Why, why not just peace. come out and say it? You don't think the Palestinians should have their own state? Because that's what you're, that's what you're effectively you because, saying. Because I represent the Israeli government. The Israeli government wants to have peace with the Palestinians. And my prime minister said in every occasion he wants to negotiate with a Palestinian leader, but not with a Palestinian leader that is having a policy of pay to slay, basically paying for people to kill innocent Jews in terror actions and rewarding terror actions. We need to have a leadership that is willing to recognize Israel's right to exist. And, and again, people want to have better future. I want to have better future. Pe people want to have peace. But Palestinians I also, want to, also peace. want to have a better future, don't they? But they refused every time they were offered a state. They refused to have a state. They prefer to go to this radical ideology that wants Israel not to exist. This is the truth behind the two-state solution failure. There was no negotiation framework between any Israeli prime ministers in the last four years that I'm here because the Palestinians were not interested. Okay, let's go to Jay in Wilsdon. Hi, Jay. Hi, Ian. Thanks for taking my call and good evening to you and the ambassador. Um, so my question is that we, we all agree, the three of us would agree, that Israel has the right to defend it. self-defense and that Hamas needs to be destroyed. I, think, I don't think there's any argument there. What I wanted to ask the ambassador, however, is in very practical terms, and I think that's really important, the practical terms, what does the right to self-defense look like for the poor Palestinians in the West Bank who are daily being attacked, killed even, by violent extremist settlers sponsored by IDF soldiers? And Ian, you'll perhaps be familiar with the reports that your colleague Matt Fry has done on this for Channel 4 News. two reports over the last 12 months where he's interviewed IDF soldiers who readily admit and talk about the guilt that they feel for snipers taking pot shots at children in the West Bank, killing them. And indeed, Save the Children reported that 38 children were murdered by the Israeli settlers up to the period September 2023, so pre-7th of October and not even in Gaza, in the West Bank. How are these Palestinians supposed to defend themselves when not only are the settlers attacking them, but IDF soldiers are actually watching on and encouraging them and egging them on and even snipering kids with precision shot into their heads? Is that well, true? Those, those are very hard accusations that have no base uh, as a matter of fact because... Save the Children no, have reported it. I've had is... Human Rights Watch, I've had Amnesty International in their Crossing Thresholds report. There are multiple reports from multiple NGOs and Israeli soldiers admitting to it live on TV with Matt Fry and their Look, colleague on Channel I'm 4 sure, News. I'm sure you're taking your information from uh, sources you believe are reliable, but uh, all I can tell well, you is... Lying? what. No, no, I want to tell you what I know. What I know is that um, in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria, the way we call it, um, there has been... Uh, increase of terrorism in Jenin. Jenin has become a huge terror hub. Our military was operating in Jenin to prevent terror attacks. We, we've seen so many terror attacks in the last year just because of the war. People forget we still get to have terrorists coming from Judea and Samaria and attacking our cities and innocent people get get killed from those terror attacks. So Israel is fighting those terror hubs and unfortunately Abu Mazen is not capable to control and in the end of the day we are in a point where those terror hubs are threatening our people. You've mentioned a lot about the radicalization of uh, Gaza and Palestinians more broadly which has sort of led to the events on October the 7th. Now you talk a lot about um, this almost like de-radicalization for education etc in the longer term. If you look at terrorist groups um, throughout history, conflicts in general, what you usually almost always find is that uh, more violent cycles of violence drive radicalization. Do you not think what's happening now and what's happened over the last 12 months is more than likely going to radicalize more people and 
despite levels of education, if people have had their parents killed, their uh, siblings killed, um, do you not think that's more likely going to drive radicalisation as opposed to okay. uh, have the adverse effect? So again, uh, Israelis lost their children, some families were wiped out totally from the Hamas attack. But I still believe most Israelis want to have peace. And, and it's important to understand that in the end of the day, if your mindset is, I want to have peace with all my neighbors, I'm not interested in war, then you will move forward to that. And again, I'm saying, I think on the other side, the mindset was not, we want to have peace with Israelis. They said, we don't want the Israelis to be there. So uh, I still believe that learning from history, you can make a difference and you can make change in societies. And, and you know from your own history <coughs> that you used to have wars in the past with different countries in Europe, and now you live peacefully with them. So change is possible. But you need to do the right things. Carl, thank you very much for that. Uh, Janie has got a final text question. After all these years of fighting, are you still able to be optimistic about the future? It is quite oh, difficult to be optimistic at this time. That's a very time, good question. I, I'll, actually, I, I want to tell you how much I appreciate this question because that was a, a year of uh, lots of moments of darkness and many Israelis felt sad and uh, like um, in a certain point we were saying, what, how's the future is like? But when I see the young Israelis are willing to really protect uh, Israel, that are willing to fight uh, radical ideology in order to uh, make sure our democracy, our Jewish country will thrive and that everyone can live peacefully in Israel but not under uh, the, this radical forces. I, I'm, I'm optimistic because we didn't lose the moral clarity that the good can prevail on the evil. And uh, I believe that Britain was like this at the Second World War and we want to be the force that is, is bringing the world together to fight those radical forces that are making our world a very dangerous place.